is uh, an evidence-based approach. Well, thanks so much for having me today, and uh, thanks for sticking out. It's been a great meeting today. And um, I wanted to disclose I have support from several organizations in my past, the American Family Neurology, Alzheimer's Association, and the National Institutes of Health have paid my student loans, so I'm very appreciative. Um, I've been a consultant for Novartis and Xera, and appreciate that Xera has uh, had the foresight uh, to put this uh, symposium together. But to be really frank and really honest, um, the biggest bias that I have, the biggest disclosure, is my Uncle Bob and my dad's cousin Charlotte. Uh, I diagnosed my dad's cousin Charlotte at a wedding about five years ago, and my Uncle Bob diagnosed Alzheimer's, uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when I was in high school. So I take a very aggressive approach, and if something is balanced in scientific evidence and safe, anything and everything as long as it's safe, then I'm going to push for it. So I trained up in Boston. I left the Amyloid Center in Boston. I came down to Miami. Um, and now you'll kind of get a, a glimpse of the way I take it, the approach of a lifestyle management with nutrition and lifestyle approaches. So I think the, the true, as, as Dr. Sperlin was talking about earlier, how we have to make, combine different avenues, I think it's uh, the multimodal approach is really where we need to go with this disease. So to, uh, to be honest, that there's been an absolute explosion of the evidence for nutrition and Alzheimer's. Um, I have been floored every time I go to PubMed or every time I read another article, it seems that uh, the evidence is expanding. Um, Dr. Corian did a great, nice, a nice overview. Um, what I'm going to try to do is go through, um, real briefly if I can, just a little bit of an overview, because sometimes at our Alzheimer's conferences we don't get to see this side of things in terms of the evidence-based nutritional approaches. Um, some of these intervention trials have actually shown effect size, sizes as large, if not larger, than those typically seen with FDA-approved drugs. In terms of AD and MCI, we can go on and on from cocoa flavanols, very low carb ketogenic diets, um, omega 3s in, in uh, age related memory loss, ketosis therapy with a medium trained triglyceride. Um, in addition, for prevention and, and reducing risk, you know, devouring colleagues with flavonoid rich berries, multiple servings of strawberries and blueberries each, each day, I'm sorry, each, uh, each week uh, can delay the onset uh, for basically for at least two years. And Scarmius and colleagues, I think we can all agree that the Mediterranean diet uh, has, of course, the most uh, profound evidence. In terms of examples, I won't get into specifics here, but this uh, slide goes through the variety of biomarkers, cognitive measures, as well as uh, decreasing uh, in terms of um, risk, in terms of having less risk, for example, with the Mediterranean diet. Um, I could spend an hour on this, but in the interest of time, we'll go through this rather briefly, and then I'll talk about my research. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take everything that all of you guys are doing all over uh, the world in terms of the nutrition aspects, and I'm trying to tailor it to my patients and then study it uh, to see can patients comply with an Alzheimer's diet, and then what are the outcomes? And I think that's where we're going, and hopefully we'll be able to get there. In terms of Mediterranean diet, in terms of class of evidence, that's certainly the highest. In terms of very low carbohydrate diet, whether it's a ketogenic diet or a ketone-based therapies, um, I think there's uh, also an, an ex exceedingly amount uh, more evidence in that area. Um, we'll talk about craft studies briefly, uh, Western-style diet versus the low-carb, uh, low-saturated fat diet. Uh, fish oils, uh, we've seen that when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, maybe the fish oils do not work, but maybe it's earlier when we have to intervene, and not all fish oil is created equal. Maybe there are specific types of omega-3s that are helpful. When it comes to B vitamins, again, when it comes to Alzheimer's, failures, yet when it comes to possible prevention, delaying onset, I think we've had some success. Antioxidants, diets, coffee and caffeine, uh, and exercise. Um, I think we can again uh, agree that the Mediterranean diet has the most profound evidence. Um, as Dr. Corian was talking about, when it comes to carbohydrate connections, whether it's decreasing oxidative stress, decreasing inflammation, we can speculate. Um, we don't really know why, to be frank. Um, but I think the evidence does suggest that reducing carbohydrates may have a long-term benefit as well as an immediate treatment effect uh, if you can get to a state of ketosis or if you can have medium chain triglycerides that can elevate ketone bodies uh, to provide an alternative source of fuel. Um, this thing that we've been seeing for years, diminished cerebral glucose metabolism, we know that the brain can't use glucose, but it can use as an alternative fuel source ketone bodies. And the only other alternative fuel the brain can use provide 60% of neuronal energy requirements is ketone bodies, so uh, that is likely the reason why some of this uh, ketosis therapy can work. Um, Dr. Kerkorian went through this briefly. Uh, the benefits are not just for memory loss, but other uh, biomarkers as well. 
when it comes to Suzanne Kraft, she's done some dynamite work comparing two different types of diets, the typical diet, the Western diet, and as well as a brain healthy diet, including saturated fats uh, or in Italy, in olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, less than 7% of saturated fat. And then uh, also use the low glycemic carbohydrates, less of an insulin spike is proposed to possibly decrease inflammation, decrease oxidative damage, decrease um, uh, brain cell damage, and finally 15 to 20% of lean protein. And what were the results? Well, again, the randomized dietary intervention study, we have memory improvement again. When it comes to fish oil, I, I think it depends on where you look. If you look at Alzheimer's disease, the data has not shown that fish oil has been effective. However, if you look at previous, uh, earlier onset, now today we're talking about preclinical Alzheimer's or secondary prevention, I think this is really where the data needs to be clarified. Initial studies showing uh, fairly high dosages, 1,720 milligrams of DHA as well as 600 of EPA, uh, did show a significant reduction in the rate of decline. This was published about six or seven years ago. However, an algae-based DHA, 900 milligrams, the MIDAS trial uh, showed an improvement in memory uh, in terms of age-related cognitive decline. So the earlier you push the spectrum, the more potential there is for benefit. Um, the other aspect is, is, as we said, it did not pan out in all comers with Alzheimer's disease. However, possibly, it's a pharmacogenomic or nutrigenomic consideration. We'll see this theme a lot, uh, and that's what some of the goal of my studies are figure out who should eat what based on their genes, nutrigenomics. It's really where the field needs to go because there was a slower rate of decline in the JAMA paper in a uh, secondary outcome or an APOE4 negative subgroup. Um, again, can't make conclusions, but it is an interesting finding. When it comes to recent evidence, again, mild to moderate Alzheimer's published uh, uh, also in 2008 ECS trial, B vitamins did not help with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. However, when you move the specter Earlier in the spectrum of Alzheimer's, we have found that mild cognitive patients with elevated homocysteine can decrease the rate of atrophy by 53% uh, in the active treatment group. Now, these are not your typical, hey, Mr. Jones, take a B vitamin. You have to look at the labels, and I educate my patients about this. One milligram of folic acid and fairly high, higher than usual, amounts of B12 and B6, 0.5 milligrams of B12 and 20 mill milligrams of B6 per day. There's not a perfect one out there, but I tell my patients to look at the labels before they buy it. When it comes to antioxidants and flavonoids, um, lots of evidence. Um, I'll, I'll just stick with the recent evidence, the last six months, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. Um, and in one, um, for example, with mild cognitive impairment patients published in hypertension, uh, cocoa powder, dark cocoa powder, with at least 500 milligrams of cocoa flavanols per day, in a randomized trial, it should improve memory, uh, improve blood pressure, and improve insulin resistance. Is this definitive evidence? Well, it's not, but it's good preliminary evidence, and it's safe. So it's become a part of my treatment regimen. I also really like dark chocolate, so it works for me. Um, when it comes to strawberries and blueberries, um, uh, you know, the boring colleagues at the Brigham and Women's uh, just published this in the Annals of Neurology, and it was able, if you had, this is not just one or two blueberries, you need to have two servings, which is a half a cup, so at least one cup of strawberries or blueberries per week, in a, in a large epidemiological trial showed a delay of cognitive decline for over two years. Again, is this definitive? It's not randomized, it's not prospective, but if uh, I'm talking to my uh, cousin Cynthia, who's my Uncle Bob's daughter, this is what I'm telling Cynthia to eat, and since I have four family members with Alzheimer's disease, again, I'm biased, this is the things that I'm eating. Okay, and I'm gonna hit this from every angle. There is no one magic pill, there's no one magic bullet, thanks to A4 and thanks for the Diane. We will get there, 2013 is gonna be an awesome year, but this is the way that I envision treating uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease, as well as mild cognitive impairment, as well as uh, the most mild, even further on stages of Alzheimer's. So wake up and smell the coffee. Guess what, that means we're more than halfway done. Um, caffeine, is it the coffee? These are European studies, prospective studies, that have shown that there may be an impact on development of dementia. There is some conflicting evidence, uh, the most recent evidence from Cal and colleagues, the University of South Florida at Tampa in, in, in mice actually looked at uh, caffeinated coffee, seemed to have the most benefit. Okay, back in the amyloid camp, maybe some uh, anti amyloid effects of caffeinated coffee, a substance X is what they called it in the study, but caffeine alone and decaf coffee did not seem to help. So, again, I like dark chocolate mochas, so I'm going to recommend it to my patients um, with skim milk, not with the 
tons of sugar and, and everything else. So again, we're doing the best we can with the evidence we have uh, based on the lab data as well as based on epidemiological research. Now the other low risk interventions I can talk about, um, I can literally talk about this for forever, um, but physical exercise I think we can all agree uh, has direct amyloid lowering uh, potential um, and patients that exercise do better. I think we can agree on that. Um, in terms of preclinical uh, Alzheimer's, I think the evidence is starting to come around that you know, if you're more active in your 40s, if, you're, if your stress test results just came out a couple weeks ago, if your stress test results are better in your 40s, that predicts a lower incidence of dementia uh, in your 80s. So I think we are making progress with this. In terms of cognitive reserve, you know, Doreen is, is a, a, a champion in this area and also has done uh, some amazing research. I think we don't have to uh, belabor that. One thing I will mention is music, um, and we'll talk about some of the research with music and talk about uh, uh, additional uh, IADLs. Um, music activities is something I recommend. Stroke risk factor modification is essential, taking a, a pretty comprehensive approach at controlling the blood pressure and some recent evidence, uh, basically in Hawaii, shows that if you uh, use beta blockers, beta blockers may have a potential uh, dementia lowering effect. Again, we need more data. Uh, stress reduction is key and social engagement. Yes, that means I will be mentioning Facebook um, in this talk today. Um, when it comes to music, um, I'm a musician. I joined a rock band. Couldn't pay the bills as a, as a physician, so I had to join a rock band. Um, but basically, there is data to support that musical experiences, lifelong musical experiences, can actually slow down brain aging and reduce memory loss. So you can tell your patients to find a hobby, a cognitively stimulating activity, play a musical instrument, or if you have it again, learn how. Um, that's what I recommend. In terms of stress, uh, Simple, simply stated, neuroticism is bad. And there's a lot of uh, evidence that shows that uh, work stress, for example, 4.5 years of work stress uh, equals one extra year of brain aging in one study. Um, worrying, well, that means I think we all need a vacation. Um, uh, worry or rumination, unconstructive repetitive thoughts, I think based on the data has the most uh, negative uh, effect in terms of brain aging. So these are things in terms of compensatory mechanisms and strategies that I can offer in my patient population and in my family and in myself, things that I'm going to recommend based on empirical evidence. When it comes to social interaction, there is a wealth of research, there's even a study, uh, you can Google it, uh, more Facebook friends, bigger brains. Yes, they actually did a study on this. Uh, <laughs> No joke, go to Dr. Google and Dr. Google will tell you. Um, and put the thumb up, social interaction uh, may uh, correlate, uh, and as I think we agree, correlate with improved hippocampal volume. So making progress there. So then we'll kind of transition. Um, again, I'm taking all of this research and doing the best that I can in 2013 to put my patients on a lifestyle regimen, a healthy brain healthy lifestyle regimen, including Alzheimer's diet, techniques as well as lifestyle enrichment. And we presented this uh, for the first time, my colleague uh, Dr. Christopher Ochner is in the audience, uh, uh, back, back in Monte Carlo, a clinical trial in Alzheimer's meeting, uh, where we basically uh, presented a, an evidence-based review of nutrition as well as a nutrition tracking system. I've been putting my patients on Alzheimer's diet for the last four or five years. It started on the back of a napkin. Um, I told my patients to record what they eat. I then put together a piece of paper and then they would come back and they would fill out this piece of paper and there was no paper left, it was all pen. And I couldn't believe it, they were going outside the boxes, they were writing on the back and they were stapling additional pieces of paper. These patients are motivated, their families are motivated, their caregivers are motivated, so we decided to do this a better way. We decided to build a database, an online database, that patients could go online themselves to track their progress. And this is called the AD Nutrition Tracking System. We are presenting a poster today and also presented a poster uh, in, uh, in Monte Carlo. Uh, this has been created um, with, I won't go into details, but it is HIPAA compliant, it's a PHP scripting language, and it's basically patients can go on and record their daily uh, dietary habits. They can also go on and record their biomarkers, meaning their blood pressure, their weight, their fasting glucose. If they want to go on a low-carb diet, some of my patients try it, they can use their keto sticks and tell me if they're, and tell the database if they're ketogenic. We can also put other markers in here, like their ApoE4 status and other uh, inflammatory biomarkers. It also teaches patients what I'm looking at, and then it shows them what they should be looking at too. And it basically can track these metrics, and it doesn't show me the metrics, but it empowers the patient to follow the metrics over time. I'll show you some screenshots. Uh, we had to put some pretty colors in so that uh, the uh, patients would like it. They click on different icons. 
We have them uh, put in food records and carbohydrate tracking, whether it's a high glycemic carb or a low glycemic carb, they learn through it. If they're clicking on berries and they put in berries, well, they're going to be uh, directed to a, a website where they can learn more about the most recent evidence about berries and the most recent uh, evidence about uh, flavonols, for example. So it has elements of artificial intelligence that are targeted to the person that is clicking. It's a, it's a tool to engage users to keep on using the system, kind of like a token economy. When it comes to biomarkers, the patients can actually see. If they enter in their blood pressure, they can see a graph. It's generated by Google Graphs. It's an open source API. Programmers can use this stuff. We put in the data, and Google Graphs then charts it for the patient. They can chart their blood glucose. They can chart their blood pressure. They can see everything, and they can tell that when they start reducing their carbohydrates, their, their glucose goes down, their waist circumference goes down. When they eat a healthier diet, less salt, less everything, their blood pressure improves too. So these are things that we're trying to empower patients to use. We can also cross-compare total, total daily carbohydrate intake with blood glucose, put them both on the same graph, and the patients actually look at this stuff. Um, and then again, here are some of those examples. We're trying to make this uh, uh, interactive tool as engaging as possible in terms of uh, putting uh, an instant uh, messaging thing where people can uh, learn if they put in things, there will be an artificial intelligent um, brain healthy um, pop-up, you know, and we'll also integrate it with social media. Um, this is going to be a prospective database. It is a prospective database. Um, does it improve outcomes? Can we even get patients on a, a compliant on an Alzheimer's type diet based on the evidence? Well, these are the things that we're learning and we are making progress. And uh, It's not easy to get people to change their diets, but what I advocate for is that every single person can start making one brain healthy choice based on the data starting today, even at their next meal. One tiny brain healthy choice. Um, in terms of personalized nutrition, I think this is where the field is going. We wrote an article uh, back in Continuum, American Academy of Neurology, um, a Continuum uh, Genetics of Dementia a couple of years ago. And basically, uh, we're going to hopefully do this database study nutrigenomic and pharmacogenomic considerations. Um, and to conclude, uh, we don't have a magic bullet uh, today. I think in the future we may with combination therapy. But in terms of the treatment of preclinical Alzheimer's disease or the secondary prevention of Alzheimer's disease, this combination therapy with low-risk dietary strategies and evidence-based lifestyle approaches, I think there's more hope now than ever for, for Alzheimer's disease. Thank you very much. Okay, we are uh, a few minutes over, but uh, anyone wants to stay and ask questions of uh, Dr. Iverson or any of the other speakers? Uh, Feel free to ask a question or come up and talk to us. And thank you all for uh, staying with us.